On December 15, 1989, all four engines suddenly failed on a KLM Airlines Boeing 747, miles above the Alaskan wilderness. Smoke filled the cockpit and the pilots tried desperately to restart the engines as their aircraft began falling towards Earth. The lives of all 245 people on board depended on whether they could restart their engines before they hit the mountains below. This is the story of KLM Flight 867. KLM Flight 867 departed Amsterdam Schiphol Airport at just after half past eight in the morning on December 15, 1989. Its destination was Narita Airport in Tokyo, Japan, with a stopover for refueling in Anchorage, Alaska. The aircraft being used for this journey was a brand new Boeing 747-400. In 1989, the 747-400 represented the state of the art in aircraft technology, having just been released that year. It was produced to be a highly advanced replacement for the 747-100 and 200, with a glass cockpit containing six screens, instead of the dozens of analogue dials that were present in the previous generation cockpits. As well as this, the functions of the flight engineer had now been automated, so it could be flown by a crew of two, a captain and a first officer. On this flight, the captain was 51-year-old Carl van der Elst. He had just over 13,000 hours of flying experience, yet because the 747-400 was so new at this time, he had just over 100 hours on this aircraft. There were two first officers on this flight, Ime Fischer, 27 years old, and Walter Verboom, also in his 20s. The crew made their way north, climbing above the English Channel for the 7,000 km journey to Alaska. Thousands of miles away, deep in the Earth's crust, trouble was brewing. The Mount Redoubt volcano in southern Alaska had erupted the previous day, and had spewed plumes of ash and smoke high into the atmosphere. It had stopped erupting on the day of this flight, but the crew had been advised of this eruption and of the possibility that the volcano may erupt again as they neared Anchorage. The dangers of volcanic ash were well known to the pilots, as seven years previously, a British Airways 747 had encountered a volcanic ash cloud at night over Indonesia and had lost power on all of its engines. The crew of that flight managed to restart their engines but not before losing thousands of feet in altitude and nearly colliding with the sea below. Volcanic ash suffocates jet engines and must be avoided at all costs. The flight progressed as normal, except for one thing. During the cruise, the crew were told that the Redoubt volcano had erupted again, and that they would have to make sure to avoid the ash cloud as they neared Anchorage. The crew were lucky that they were flying during the daytime. At night, they would not be able to see the ash cloud out the windscreen, and volcanic ash is not visible on weather radar, as this can only detect water droplets and not tiny particles of ash. 11 hours after leaving Amsterdam, the crew began their descent into Anchorage. There were clouds in front of them, but they did not know whether these were volcanic ash clouds. The Redoubt volcano was about 250 kilometers away, and neither they nor air traffic control had up-to-date information on the location of the ash cloud. As they passed through 26,000 feet, the first officer made contact with Anchorage Air Traffic Control. Shortly after this, things took a dramatic turn for the worse. The aircraft then entered the cloud, and when acrid smoke started to fill the cockpit, 
The pilots quickly realised that they had flown into volcanic ash. They donned their oxygen masks and the first officer called air traffic control. Uh, we don't know. We have to go out of the moment, sir. Okay, let's go figure the moment, sir. Channel 867, heavy roger left. It's your discretion. The captain pushed the engines to maximum thrust and entered a rapid climb to get out of the ash cloud. The crew didn't realise it, but this decision to apply maximum engine thrust will only make matters worse. As the aircraft flew through the ash cloud, the ash which entered the engines was melted by their extremely high temperatures and turned into glass. This molten ash clogged up the engines, suffocating them. Starved of air, the engines could no longer combust fuel, and they all died in rapid succession. Without engine power, the aircraft entered a rapid descent. The loss of engine power also meant that there was no electricity to power the flight instruments. This caused a temporary blackout in the cockpit as the instruments switched to standby power. With no engines to power the aircraft forwards, the plane was now essentially a giant glider, descending steadily towards the mountains below. If the pilots couldn't restart the engines, they would end up crashing their plane into the Alaskan mountains, killing everyone on board. The captain handed control of the aircraft over to the first officer while he tried to restart the engines. He made repeated attempts to restart them, but was met with no success. The aircraft continued descending rapidly towards the mountains below. To make matters worse, at various points during this fall, when the captain did manage to restart one or two of the engines, the electrical power source for the aircraft switched from the standby battery to the engine, and when it did, there was a temporary power interruption which left all of the cockpit instrumentation blank. This gave the pilots the impression that the standby power was failing and that they were hopelessly falling towards the earth below. The crew had no idea that, at least intermittently, their engine restart attempts were working. During this terrifying descent, the pilots lost vital instrumentation, including their airspeed readings. They also received a warning that there was a fire in the forward cargo deck. As it happened, this reading was false, but the pilots had no way of knowing this. Their situation now appeared truly dire. A fire is perhaps the worst emergency on board an aircraft, and the survival rate of in-flight fires is not encouraging. For the 231 passengers, their normal flight would have quickly turned into a nightmare. They would have heard the reduction in engine noise and felt themselves rising up in their seats as the aircraft entered a rapid descent. They would have smelled and seen the wispy sulfuric ash which was now entering the cabin. It would also have been unusually dark inside the cabin, as the thick volcanic ash surrounding the aircraft blocked the daylight from outside. The crew's only hope in saving the aircraft was by restarting the engines and restoring electrical power to the aircraft's instruments. The captain had made five attempts to restart the engines, and then six, and then seven. The aircraft had now descended over 10,000 feet, and time was running out. As the engines had stopped running, they began to cool. And as they cooled, the molten ash inside them solidified and became brittle. The air rushing through the engines then dislodged this solidified ash, and piece by piece it started to break off. On the captain's eighth attempt, he managed to restart the engines on the left-hand side of the aircraft. During this time, the aircraft was descending through 13,000 feet. The 747 can fly on two engines, but only just. Given the mountainous terrain they were flying over, and their distance to the airport, the crew were eager to get the remaining two engines restarted. Finally, as they reached 11,000 feet, engines 3 and 4 coughed back to life. They were now fully capable of making the runway at Anchorage. However, even though the engines were back working, the plane was not out of the woods yet. The pilots had trouble seeing out the windshield, as it had effectively been sandblasted by coarse volcanic ash. Air traffic control guided them towards the airport, and eventually they landed without incident. Here's a picture of the flight crew inspecting their aircraft in Anchorage. When the 747 was inspected after landing, over 80 kilograms of ash was found in its engines. The damage caused to the engines was so great that they each had to be replaced. The cockpit windshield as well as the leading edges of the wings also had to be replaced as these had suffered substantial damage from being sandblasted by the volcanic ash. In all, the cost of repairing the aircraft was 150 million US dollars in today's money. 
The aircraft continued to fly with KLM until its retirement in 2018. As an interesting side note, when I was researching this incident, I came across a video of this aircraft's final flight, which took place in 2018. The captain of this flight was none other than Walter Verboom, who was one of the first officers on board KLM Flight 867. I've linked this video in the description below. In response to the threat of volcanic ash to aircraft around the world, the International Civil Aviation Organization recommended that a number of volcanic ash advisory centers, or VAACs, be established around the world to monitor volcanic ash clouds that could impact aviation operations and to send out appropriate warnings. By the late 1990s, nine centers were established, which covered all of the world's airspace. These have already been successful in their aim, preventing numerous flights into volcanic ash and informing Europe's response to the eruption of an Icelandic volcano in the year 2011. As well as these preventative measures, guidelines have since been published which advise pilots on how to deal with volcanic ash in case they do fly into it. These involve reducing engine thrust to flight idle so that temperatures fall below 1100 degrees Celsius, which is the melting point of the silicate particles in volcanic ash. If the ash can't melt, then it can't stick to the engine components and block off the airflow needed for combustion. The guidelines also advise pilots to do a 180 degree turn, as this is the fastest way of getting back into clear air. The KLM incident would not have been as severe if these guidelines had been available and followed at the time, but it's still miraculous that this incident ended without any loss of life or even injury. Special thanks to the Patreon and YouTube members for helping to make this video possible. If you'd like to help grow Green Dot Aviation, you can do so by tapping on the links here on screen, and I'd be very grateful for your support. I'd especially like to thank Andrew Shaiskalov, Antelo Pony, and Gar Farrell for their very generous contributions. I hope you enjoyed this video, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next week for another episode.